Today's sermon is entitled, Why Jesus Came. We're looking at uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, and then we're going to get into uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Before we do that, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word, and we ask that you'll give us understanding today by the power of your spirit. Uh, Lord, we need your help when we come and sit before your word that you would uh, illuminate the text to our hearts and minds. And so we ask that you'll do that today and that you'll transform us for, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So beginning in 1 John chapter 1, let's uh, read verse 10 and then verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours only, but for also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. May God write the eternal truths of His Word upon your heart and mine. Well, as we, begin, we begin to move into our passage this week. Paul has he's been dealing with Gnostics in the church and the false teaching that they were spreading. Now, Gnostics, of course, they were dualists. They, they said that the, the spirit is good and the flesh is bad. Uh, so they, didn't, they thought it didn't matter how you lived your life. I mean, because Christianity has to do with our spirit, right? And not with the flesh. And therefore, what we do in the flesh doesn't really matter. So their first erroneous claim was that you could have fellowship with God and, and still live like a pagan. Well, the second claim was that once you're a Christian, you don't have any sin in your nature anymore. They ignored the struggle that all Christians have with sin's influence throughout our lives. The third false claim was that you've actually stopped sinning. And it's a denial that is so great that John says any claim like that, a claim of perfection, really makes God a liar. And it demonstrates that His Word is not dwelling in us because God's Word from beginning to end uh, says that sin is a present experience even in the life of a believer. And so the proper attitude of the Christian is not to deny that we have a sin problem anymore, but instead to realize the ongoing reality of sin and then confess it to God. Now, as John writes these things, he's an old apostle by this time at the end of the first century, probably in the mid 90s A.D. And he is the last living apostle as he writes affectionately to the church that is scattered abroad. And so he begins by addressing them as my little children. So that's a term of endearment. And John writes, he's, he's writing to make known his purpose to us in his writing. This is not only in verse 1, I mean, in, in, the first, in 1 John, where, this is not the only place where he declares his purpose in writing. There are multiple purposes in writing. This is just one of them. But he says, he says, so that you may not sin, which would seem to be a self-apparent truth. Why would you need to instruct the church that you uh, shouldn't, should not sin, except for the fact these Gnostic false teachers had come into the church. So John tells us, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He writes to uh, refute those who contradict the truth. And in doing so, he's saying, turn a deaf ear to these false teachers. It does matter what happens in your body. Then he says, if anyone sins, and I said earlier, uh, the, the false teachers had also said that you could reach this state of sinless perfection here upon this earth. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. And so John writes, if anyone sins, most correctly, when anyone sins, knowing the inev inevitability of a true believer sinning, that even though we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we've been saved, we still continue to sin. So he writes this for encouragement. He says, we have an advocate with the Father. Well, an advocate, of course, is, a, is like a defense attorney. It's one who would appear in a court of law and provide defense for one who is being accused by a prosecuting attorney. And this speaks of how Satan, who is the accuser of all believers, Revelation 12.10, brings accusation against God's elect before the throne of God day and night. And John writes to assure believers that, that as this accusation is taking place before the throne of God day and night, all your sins are being named before the throne of God in heaven by Satan himself. But you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he continues to make intercession for you because uh, as these accusations are being brought before the Father in heaven, it is Jesus, the only perfectly righteous man who is pleading the merit of his own blood on behalf of those who have put their trust, their faith in him. So you need not worry 
as if you could ever fall away from grace or lose your salvation or be pried away from the Father by these accusations that are being brought against you before heaven's court day and night. You have an advocate who can never lose a case, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And then John says in verse 2, He Himself, referring to the Lord Jesus, meaning there's no one else making intercession for you at the right hand of the Father in heaven, but Jesus Christ the righteous, He continues to make this intercession and represent you for, before the Father. He Himself, and now here it is, He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. When John says that, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world, He means to say at least two things. First, He means to say that Jesus is the one Savior for the world. Jew and Gentile, slave free, male, female, all kinds of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Or to put it in John's language, Jesus' propitiation, His satisfaction of God's wrath, extends to the whole world of those who by God's grace are regenerated by the Holy Spirit and therefore trust in Him by faith, receiving the benefits of His death and resurrection and embracing the gospel. It's not just for a little group of Christians in Asia Minor to whom he's writing. It's for everyone in the world who trusts in him who embraces the gospel. That's what Jesus' propitiation is for. It's for all those who trust in him, all his people for whom he died. And by the way, that enlarges the Christian's heart for the world, doesn't it? Or it should. God has people in the world that he is drawing to himself and they will embrace the only satisfaction for their sins. Well, secondly, John means that Jesus is the only way of salvation for the whole world. He means, that, you know, Jesus is not just one good way among many. He's not even just the best way among many. He is the only way you can come to know God. He is the only way you can get forgiveness of sins. And again, to put it in John's language, Jesus is the only God provided satisfaction for the sins of the world. And therefore, everyone must come to Him and only Him if they're to have their sins forgiven. In other words, John is being ex exclusive here. He is saying that any, all, and only those who trust in Jesus are saved. Because Jesus is not interceding for unbelievers in heaven. He's interceding only for those who put their faith or trust in Him. And ultimately, only those whose names are written on His hands and, and in the book of life. Wherever they are upon the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ makes intercession for us and His blood is a propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is one of the most important words in the entire Bible. It's a word that's theologically rich. It's full of doctrine and what it represents. It uniquely describes the effect of the cross upon God the Father. You know, most often when we think about our salvation, we think of the effects of the cross upon us as, as sinners. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's a good way to think about it. We think most often of the effect of the cross on us. Redemption means that Christ's death has bought us. Forgiveness means that Christ's death has pardoned us. Uh, justification means that Christ's death imputed His righteousness to us. Reconciliation means that God's death, uh, excuse me, that Christ's death has united us to God the Father. And adoption means that Christ's death receives us into God's family. But this word propitiation, it stands out. It is unique in that it does not deal with us. It deals with God the Father. It is the effect of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection on our Father in heaven. So on this Lord's Day, you know, as we think here about this Christmas Eve morning, uh, as we consider the Incarnation, I think it would, be, it would bring glory to God for us to consider what the cross means to the Father in heaven. That's why Jesus came. And in fact, this is to go to the very apex of the meaning of the cross. Because God is always greater than we are, and His concerns are always greater than ours. And as, as, a, as great as our reconciliation and our justification and our forgiveness and our adoption is... Well, the effect of the cross upon God the Father is greater still. So I want us to consider this morning this word propitiation as we see it in verse 2. And by the way of introduction, this word means satisfaction. It means appeasement. 
Uh, it, the word means that God is utterly satisfied with the death of Christ for our sins. We're going to look at propitiation under three headings. We're only going to cover the first one today, and that is the need for propitiation. Unless we understand the need, then we're not going to treasure it as we should. And then next week, we're going to look at the nature of propitiation and the effect of propitiation. So let's begin with this. We need to understand our need for propitiation. And the need is very simply this. It's not explicitly stated in the text, but it is supposed to be implicitly understood from the rest of Scripture. The need is this. It is the holy anger and the fierce, just wrath of God toward every sinner and toward all sin. So let's turn to Psalm 5 for a moment, verses 5 and 6. It says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. Now, standing before God's eyes means they will not stand with acceptance. They will not stand with God's approval. Oh, they're going to stand in the judgment. Make no mistake about that. But they're not going to stand with God's approval. And at the end of verse 5, speaking of God, he says, it says, you hate all evil doers. You know, sometimes we hear the statement, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. Well, that's true. It just doesn't go far enough. It doesn't say everything it needs to say. Uh, uh, he doesn't say if you are in Christ Jesus, he doesn't hate you. He, he doesn't hate you if you're in Christ Jesus. He loves you. But people who resist the gospel, they often think, well, if God exists and, and if I live a pretty moral life, you, you know, if I don't go out and do anything horrible, uh, when I stand before God one day, surely he's going to let me into heaven. But the Bible is so clear that works done by unregenerate men or women, even though they may be things that God has commanded in his word, because they don't proceed from a heart of faith, they are sinful and cannot please God. Hebrews eleven six. without faith it is impossible to please God. So that sheds some light upon Proverbs 21, 4. I like the King James Version here because it says, The plowing of the wicked is sin. The farmer goes out into the field in order to make a living to feed his family, is simply storing up wrath for himself because he does so without faith. And he's living his life in rebellion against a holy God. Well, of course, God is also a God of grace and mercy. He does love those who are the object of his love. In fact, God loves his elect with an everlasting love. But here in Psalm 5, 5, it says God hates all evildoers. Not simply the acts of sin. This is saying more than God rejects the wicked. There is a vengeance and a wrath that God has in his holiness toward every sinner outside the kingdom of heaven. Then turn over to Psalm 7, verse 11. There we read, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. And again, I, I, I do like the New King James here, which says, God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. This word indignation in the ESV and angry in the New King James speaks of the fury of his righteous anger towards the sinner in their sin. So, God, so notice God's response in verse 12 here in Psalm 7. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Now last week, you know, we talked about an archer and how we all missed the mark. We're talking in terms of sin. We all missed the mark in keeping God's commands, well, God always shoots a bullseye in everything he does. As Charles Spurgeon has said, he said here, God never misses his target. So God finds the sinner offensive in, in his or her sin. And if you're not under the blood of Jesus, this is devastatingly, horrifically bad news. I, I don't take any delight in telling it because we all know people that we really care about. Uh, some we love whom we are afraid for them based on their own statements about how they have rejected Christ and his gospel. Now we've all grown up with gospel tracts that, pa that are passed out, you know, and they begin this way. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, yes, Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Of course, that's a true statement. It's part of scripture. It's simply, the verse just doesn't say everything we need to know 
about God's disposition towards sin and those outside the kingdom. Because there are other verses like Psalm 5 and Psalm 7 that tell us the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. He hates evildoers. God does hate the one who violates and breaks His law. So for believers, this, this should also humble us into the dust that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God regenerated us, made us alive in Christ. We didn't even have the good sense or the ability until He raised us from the dead spiritually to even believe upon Him that the only thing we contributed to our salvation was our sin and our need for a Savior. He saw nothing in us to save us. He just put His love on us at the same time. This truth should raise us up to the heavens that God has set His love upon us from before the foundation of the world. And He's worked all things in our lives to bring us to salvation through the Holy Spirit, applying the gospel in our hearts and giving us the gift of faith to believe. And the reason I'm laboring all this is because we need to have a biblical theology that takes into account the full counsel of God. And so as we're speaking of propitiation, our need for it, oh, how we need for God's wrath and His anger to be satisfied in and through Christ. See, biblically, it's not enough in salvation that I am pardoned. It's not enough that I am justified and reconciled and adopted and so forth. According to God's plan uh, and, and, and all of His attributes and character, all of that had to contain something that happened toward God. In order for full salvation to occur, God's own standard, His attributes, His character. Think about it for a moment, dear friends. On this Christmas Eve, Lord's Day, there had to be the appeasement of the wrath of God toward me, the sinner. Then in Psalm 45, verse 7, it, now, it includes uh, now not only the sinner, but acts of sin. And that makes, of course, that, that's, that makes very much good sense. I mean, you, he says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Well, yeah, of course, God hates wickedness. God's not indifferent to the sin of man. Neither is he neutral toward the sinner. He, the one who's outside the kingdom and outside Christ. The one who is not born from above. There is an active, passionate hatred that is holy and righteous in the heart of God toward the sin. It must be that way. It is necessarily the result according to God's attributes and character. Well, then in John, in the New Testament, John 3.16, the most well-known verse in all of Scripture probably. There, there is a love-hate relationship as both are perfectly demonstrated toward lost sinners. So, you know, chapter th John 3, 16, uh, For God so loved the world, this is a world in rebellion, a world in sin, a world that's broken His law, a world that is repugnant to God, a world that has provoked His wrath. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And there, there we see clearly this active, passionate, engaged love of God, demonstrating His love towards sinners. And sometimes people stop with verse 16, though, and that's the entirety of their gospel presentation. That God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. But you need to continue to read the rest of the chapter because there's more. In fact, in verse 18, it says, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. He's under judgment, the judgment of God, as long as that person is in a state of unbelief. And, but when we come to the end of the chapter, in verse 36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, present tense. And we're quick to say, know that the very moment you put your trust in Jesus Christ, eternal life is yours, present tense. Possession. It's your present possession. The moment you believe right now, you are the recipient of, of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But, verse 30, but, but at the end of that verse, verse 36b also says, God's wrath, present tense, remains on an unbeliever. That is, whoever does not obey the Son, whoever does not obey the Gospel, whoever does not obey the command to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he who does not obey the gospel invitation and enter through the narrow gate, John 3, 36b says, shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him, present tense. This very moment in this world, this lifetime, in an unconverted state outside of Christ, 
God does now this moment have his wrath upon that sinner. And even for a believer, this is a painful realization, as I said earlier, because we all have people in our lives that we love and people about whom we're concerned because by their own statements, they cause us to believe they're still outside the kingdom. And that which is pushing the wrath of God from heaven upon this sinner is the holiness of Almighty God. So God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, that's verse 16. God is angry with you and his wrath remains upon you. That's verse 36. We need them both. How this truth in this kind of gospel preaching needs to be known in our world today. This is how the gospel was once preached in past generations. But we've dumbed it down so much and we've, we've been economical with the truth. Uh, you know, so much that we've almost presented God as a benevolent grandfather who's like a cosmic vending machine. We fail to explain sin, the wrath of God against sin. Romans 1, verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed. Notice present tense. Right now, this moment, the wrath of God is being manifested from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And if they continue in their unbelief, if they continue in their sin and rebellion against God and His Word, the wrath of God abides on them. So God's not a doting grandfather in heaven. He's not there pacing back and forth, wringing His hands, desiring sinners to come to Him as if He's some kind of benign, powerless, cosmic, parental figure. No, He is in heaven full of indignation every day toward those who are outside of Christ. So let's end this way. Jonathan Edwards preached the most famous ser sermon ever preached on American soil. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. If you've never read it, I, I encourage you to do so. And as he preached that sermon, it became the spark really that ignited the great awakening in America. I'm going to read a few excerpts from it uh, because it just takes your breath away to hear a man preach like this. He says, part of the sermon, The wrath of God is like great waters that are dammed for the present. They increase more and more and rise higher and higher till an outlet is given. And the longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty is its course when once it is let loose. It is true that judgment against your evil work has not been executed hitherto. The floods of God's vengeance have been withheld, but your guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing. And you are every day treasuring up more wrath. The waters are continually rising and waxing more and more mightily. And there is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that holds the waters back. If God should only withdraw His hand from the floodgate, it would immediately fly open and the fiery floods of the fierceness and the wrath of God would rush forth with inconceivable fury and would come upon you with omnipotent power. And if your strength were 10,000 times greater than it is, yea, 10,000 times greater, than the strength of the stoutest, sturdiest devil in hell, it would be nothing to withstand or endure it. The bow of God's wrath is bent, and His arrows made ready on the string, and justice bends the arrow at your heart, and, there strains, and strains the bow. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God, and that of an angry God, without any promise or obligation at all, that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk. With your blood. O oh, sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit full of fire of, of wrath, that you're held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much as you as at, at, against you as against that of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder. And you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself. Nothing to keep off the flames of wrath. Nothing of your own. Nothing that you've ever done. Nothing that you can do to induce God to spare one moment. End quote. Dear friends, this is the need we have for propitiation. This is the great need for God to satisfy His own wrath in His Son, Jesus Christ. Going to have to stop here this week and we'll pick up next week with the nature of propitiation and the effect, but let's end this way. 
Dear friends, if you're listening to this sermon today and you've never placed your trust in Jesus Christ, then by God's help and grace, right where you are, turn to Jesus and embrace Him this very moment. Today is the day of salvation. Confess your sins. Confess that you're hopeless, that you're helpless without Christ. Ask God to help you turn from your sin and follow Him in His Word. Jesus is your only hope for salvation, forgiveness of sins, and the placation of God's holy and just wrath. But if you have embraced Jesus Christ and you've trusted in Him for forgiveness of sin, John is reminding you and me, keep looking to your Savior. God's wrath is no longer upon you. His favor has been placed upon you. But the fight against sin is long. It's not going to end uh, until you're taken to glory one day. So keep looking to the one who is your righteous advocate and who's paid the penalty for your sins has satisfied God's just judgment and wrath in your place. What a wonderful Savior we have. And hasn't He given us a wonderful word? Glory be to God. Our Lord and our God, by your grace and mercy and by the work of Holy Spirit, will you draw us to Jesus and never let us go. Forgive our sins. Hear our prayers. In his name we pray. Amen.